We're going to say greetings to everyone and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden and as usual, uh, we're glad to bring you the word of the Lord and the things that uh, God has to say to us <clears throat> in his word. We're so grateful uh, for this opportunity and uh, we pray that you have been uh, being blessed by the messages that the Lord have uh, given us today and on a, on a regular basis. Amen. So we have been talking about the wages of sin, and I think that's very important that people understand and that people know that there are there is a such thing as a wage of sin. In other words, a payment or a reward of what we do. That we will give an account according to the word of God. We will give an account for the deeds that are done in this body. And so that right there ought to be a wake up call for us. There's something about that, the fact that we will give an account, just like what the Word of God says. We will give an account for the deeds that are done in this body. And so my prayer is, is that we will take heed to that before uh, we yield to temptation, before we do things that we know are contrary to God's will. My prayer is, is that we will know without a shadow of a doubt that we will give an account like er everything that we do in this life, we're going to have to give an account for it. We're going to have to answer for the things that we do, the things that we choose to do, the deeds that we do in this body. So my prayer is that we will think about that before we, we yield to the enemy, before we uh, um, yield to his temptation. So uh, that being said, we're going to continue on with that, the wages of sin. In other words, the payment of sin. And we're going to go throughout the Bible as this lesson continues to show you that there are wages for sin. Uh, people think that there's a difference between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. And the truth of the matter is God has always judged sin and he continues to judge sin. Now, um, the 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 question is have we repented of that sin and placed that on jesus christ so that his payment is enough sufficient for us have we accepted uh the lord jesus christ paying for our sins you see that's that's the question there so if you don't bring those things to jesus christ then as i've said before you yourself will pay for them so we're going to go to the 24th chapter of the book of second samuel and we're going to read a few things there and uh, we're going to read the story that I think is very, very interesting. So the 24th chapter of the book of 2 Samuel, and we're going to read, start reading at verse 1. And it says, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. So, um... Of course, you have to know that to understand this concept and what was going on, that God had, it was God's law that the children of Israel would not be numbered. In other words, uh, that was a lack of faith in, in God's eyes. And basically, it was a slap in God's face because God did, God, if you think about it, God had told Abraham, and they all knew that, that they would be as the sands of the sea. If you, Jesus, the Lord told them, if you could number the sands of the sea or the, the um, stars of the sky, then you know how much was in Israel. In other words, they were going to be a, a, a people uh, uh, plenty of plenty. They were going to be, there was going to be so many of them. And so they were at times tempted to count themselves uh, because of the, <clears throat> the enemies that they had round about them. And of course, that wasn't God's will. God did not want them to depend on their strength. God did not want them to depend on, on their numbers for their deliverance. You see, and the same thing goes for us today. God does not want you to depend on your numbers. And in other words, what you feel it validates you. Uh, God does not want you to depend on that um, uh, as, a, as a show of strength. You see that? I believe if me personally... If I know the will of the Lord, I believe we ought to follow it regardless of what finances look like, regardless of what circumstances look like. You see that? And so <clears throat> the Bible says his anger was kindled against Israel. And so he moved David to, to, 
say, go and number the children of Israel and Judah. So let's hold your spot right there. We're going to go back to that. We want to read. If you have your Bible, let's go to the 21st chapter of First Chronicles. The 21st chapter of First Chronicles and the first verse is the same story. Now, we want to point out something here. So this is <clears throat> the... <clears throat> This is the exact same story. And so in this one, it says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So I want you to look at the difference there. In the first same story, the first verse of the 24th chapter, 2 Samuel says, and, the, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go and number Israel and Judah. But in the 21st chapter of 1 Chronicles, the first verse, it said, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, what is the, how do you put those thing, two things together? We don't know exactly what it was that the children of Israel and Judah were doing um, to kindle God's anger. But apparently it was... It was sin. Whatever it was they were doing, it was sin. And the Bible doesn't go into detail about what it was they were doing. And so Satan, that was the way Satan stood up against Israel. He, Satan, caused Israel to sin. Okay, and that's what it means when it says Satan stood up against Israel. Now, that, that, I think that, that brings about us uh, uh, an important point uh, that we want to make here. The fact that whenever Satan tempts you to sin no matter how good that sin feels to your flesh make no mistake about it he's standing against you when he brings you temptation it's not just to get you in trouble with god it's not to appease your flesh or to get you uh carnal minded or fleshly it is him attacking you now that's 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 something that you have to think about there that when satan comes to tempt you it's not because he's friends with you. It's not because he just wants you to feel good or anything like that or wants you to have pleasure. It, it is his way. Satan's temptation of you is him coming directly against you. And in the way that he does it basically is he makes you your own worst enemy. Not him, you. You see that? He makes you your own worst enemy. So look at what that says in verse 1 of chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David. See, so Satan stood up against Israel. In other words, Satan tempted Israel to do whatever sin it was they were doing. And so now we go back to chapter 24, 2 Samuel, verse 1. It says, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So because they fell for the temptation, you see that? Because they were doing whatever it was Satan was putting in their heart to do, we see right here, the Bible says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And so when we read the word moved, David was moved, God allowed David's heart to be moved. You see that? Against Israel to say, go number Israel and Judah. So we're going to pick up at verse two of, of uh, 2 Samuel, the 24th chapter. It says, for the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people, how many soever they be, an hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my lord the king delight in this thing? You see that? Why are you, what, what is your problem that you, you want to do this? All right. Verse four, notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host and Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Now, uh, we'll, we'll, let's go ahead and bring this out. Um, this says that, that basically Joab tried to talk King David. Now, Joab was a captain of the host. In other words, he was one of the generals of the military and I'm sure one of David's advisors. And Joab asked the king, why, why are you doing this? In other words, he tried to talk him out of it and I'm sure he went to the his other lieutenants or whatever 
And they all tried to talk David out of doing this. But verse 4 says, notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the hosts. Now you see that. You may wonder sometimes why you as a believer, you could see somebody doing something wrong. Even people that claim to be believers, you could see them headed down the wrong path. And, and to you, it just makes sense. Hey, you need to be serving the Lord or you don't need to do whatever it is you're doing. You need to ask the Lord to change that because that goes against God's word. And you can see very clearly that they're headed down a path that's going to collide with the wrath of God. And you may wonder how in the world can they not see where this is going to lead to? How in the world can they not see that this is to their own detriment? Could it be that God himself have allowed them to be on that path to fulfill judgment on themselves? In other words, sometimes... When God's ready to judge somebody, he will allow them to go down the wrong path to cause them to walk to their own judgment. You see that even with the prophet Balaam, God has spoke to him and told him not to go with the king of Moab and the, Mo and the Moabites. But he heard that word clearly. But instead of sticking with that word, he decided to go back to God and talk to God some more about it. And God told him, yeah, go ahead and go. But see, it was to his own death, it was to his own destruction. You see that it was to his own death. And so a lot of times that's what take place. God is ready to judge us because of our hard hearts and he will allow us to walk down a path. You see that, that, that uh, it's clear to everybody else is the wrong thing to do. It's clear to everybody else that you shouldn't be on that path. And, and so that's why I believe it's very important that when we, have something come up in our hearts we have a mind to do something go to god's word and see if god's word line up with what it is that we're trying to do because sometimes we can be so stubborn sometimes if we're not careful we can be so hard-hearted that maybe just maybe god is letting us go down that path uh, uh against even the very goodness you see of, of what we think we ought to do. In other words, sometimes <clears throat> we can have our mind so made up to do something and we m totally get blindsided, you know, because of what's really going on on the inside of our heart. And that's the reason why it's important that we always line up with God's word. Let's always go to God's word before we make any decisions in our lives. You see that? So, <clears throat> Verse 4, notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. And they passed over Jordan and pinched in Aurora on the right side of the city that lieth in the midst of the river of Gad and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead to the land of the Tetum, Hachi, and they came to Danjan and, ab and about to Zidon and came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and of the Canaanites and they went out to the south of Judah even to Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days and Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king and there were in Israel eight hundred thousand valiant men that drew the sword and men of Judah were five hundred thousand men and David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. See that? So right after this was done, he understood, I have messed up. I have sinned against God. And a lot of times that's what take place. We're not careful. We'll have something so deep in our heart that we're not going to be satisfied until we do it, until we do it. And if we're not careful, you see, we'll walk right into it and right afterwards we'll know, oh, man, I, I, that was the wrong thing to do. Well, you have to think about this. If, you, if that's the case with you, then you have to know that it was already in your mind that it was wrong deep down there. But because your heart's not right, that's the reason why you walked into it. Something in your heart caused you to do that. 
Ultimately, you're going to do what's in your heart versus what's in your mind. You see that? You'll do what's in your heart. All right. Verse 11, for when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus said the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or would thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. So you see that prophet there, what he does, he, he didn't come there to bless David. The Bible says he was David's seer. So he didn't come there to bless David. He came there uh, with the word of the Lord to give him three choices. Now that was God's doing. Tell David, he got three things I can do to him. Famine in the land for seven years. You see that? Three months. I'll cause your enemies to get behind you and chase you all over the place, you know, and basically you fall to them for 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 uh, three months or three days pestilence. He said, now tell me what, what it is, what your choice is, so that I can go back to God and tell him. Now notice, the Bible makes it clear that David himself was a prophet. Now we know that, that David was a prophet. But as long as he was walking in disobedience, he was out of fellowship with the Lord. So let's keep reading verse 14. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time upon it. And there died of the people from Dan even to Bathsheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people it is enough stay now thine hand and the angel of the lord was by the threshing place of arana the jebusite and david spake unto the lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said lo i have sinned and i have done wickedly but these sheep what have they done let thy hand i pray thee be against me and against my father's house so david still didn't quite understand what the whole purpose of it was the Bible makes it clear that it was Israel that was sinning. Is God was anger was kindled against Israel because of their sin. But in David's mind, I'm the one that did the counting. You know, I'm the one that ordered this numbering of, of the Israelites. And David didn't understand that God had it in for all of them, and he was judging the ones that he, he had it in for. That's, that's what he didn't understand. And so he had the right mindset when he said, we don't want to fall into the hands of men because they're not merciful. But let us fall into the hands of God because he's mercy. His mercies are great. And so you see there in verse 16, it says the Lord, it repented of the Lord. The Lord repented him of the evil. In other words, he felt sorry for them. And if you, if you read that in the 21st chapter of 1 Chronicles, you see he told the angel, stay thine hand put the, and put the sword back in the sheath. So what was going on, there was literally an angel standing over these cities. According to the word of God, he was, his, his, he was as tall as the clouds. You see that? He was standing, his feet were on the ground, and his, his head went into the clouds. And so David saw that angel just swinging that sword above these cities. Uh, of course, an angel that tall, you can imagine how, how big his sword would have been. And I'm sure the whole sword just stretched over a whole cities at a time as he was slaying people. An angel was sent to do that. And of course, verse 17, And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. Verse 18, And Gad came that day to David, and said unto him, Go up, rear, and altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. 
In other words, there had to be a sacrifice. Whenever there is sin, there has to be a sacrifice to move that sin out of the way. Something in your life, if you don't give that over to the Lord, you yourself will sacrifice for it. In other words, you yourself will pay for it. Verse 22, verse 22, And Arana said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing floor instruments, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arana as a king give unto the king. And Arana said unto the king, The lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Arana, Nay, but I will surely buy it, it of thee at a price, neither will I offer uh, burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. I'm, I'm going to read that again because the Lord really wants you to see something there. Verse 24, and the king, so what's, let me, let me explain what's taking place. David has come to Arana to buy the threshing floor and the things there. Uh, to offer up a sacrifice so that the plague can be stopped. And Arana, out of the goodness of his heart, says, no, take, just take whatever you want, David. You're the king. Uh, you know, th this is for a good cause. Take whatever you want. My prayer is, is that the Lord will accept this sacrifice. So just take it. You could just have it. Verse 24, And the king said unto Arana, No, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. What is he saying? David is saying, I am not going to come before God. I It is impossible, in other words, to serve God, to offer up your body as a living sacrifice. It is impossible to live for God with your whole heart and it don't cost you something. If it don't cost you something, in other words, denying your flesh, if it don't cost you something, you're not really living for the Lord. You see that? Living for the Lord, offering your body as a living sacrifice, that comes as a great, with a great price. There's a price to be paid to serve God. You see that? So last part of that verse says, So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. Let's read that last part again. So the Lord was entreated for the land. In other words, just exactly what we read yesterday, God was satisfied for with the payment. In other words, when you walk in a store, uh, you see different things in that store and different things have different prices. And so if you want something in that store, you have to buy it. And so you pick it up, you put it in the basket, you get, or you take it with you, you get to the counter, uh, the, the checkout lady, uh, a man, uh, run it through the system and they tell you this costs such and such. This costs so much. Well, you make the payment for that, and the only way you can get out of that store with that, with it legally, is if the payment have if the store have been entreated. In other words, the payment for that have been satisfied. And the only way we can live a life without sin, the only way we could get to heaven, is if the payments for what we have done have been satisfied. And there is only one way. Now, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He's the way. So what did he mean when he said he's the way? You have to go through him. In other words, you have to accept the fact that he's already paid for our sins. And you have to accept that payment. Now, I don't know why it's in the minds of people or why that's such a bad thing to so many people. I don't understand why so many people want to live themselves and pay, live in sin and pay for that sin themselves. Why not just come to the Lord and repent of your sins and, and put that under the blood? In other words, 
take those things that you've done to the cross and allow what Jesus did to be the sacrifice. In other words, the payment for what you've done. You see that? So that's what he means. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I am the way, he says. Jesus says that. I am the way. So if you want to get to God, God does not, in other words, it is impossible for God to accept your payment. If anybody that has ever been to a foreign country, foreign countries does not accept, most of them does not accept United States currency, U U.S. currency, and vice versa. And so the only way you can buy things there is if you go to an exchange or a bank or a bank or whatever, and you exchange your money or what you have for money for theirs because it's at a different rate. In other words, $200, I know for a fact, $200 in Australia is not the same as $200 over here. In Australia, $200 is around $145 here. I know that for a fact. And so the, the currency, even though they're calling them dollars, is not the same weight. So what am I saying? Your blood and your sacrifice and the things that you try to do to be in right standing with God will not equal to what Jesus Christ did. You have to exchange that. How do you exchange? What is the exchange? Your faith in Jesus Christ is the exchange for the payment that Jesus Christ did. That's it. Your faith, you believing in Jesus Christ and what he did is the exchange. In other words, what you do is not enough. What You can live for a million years and still not satisfy the payment of your sin in God's eyes. Why? Because you were born in sin. So your blood that you shed, your life that you give would never be enough for God. God had to, send his, had to send his son, a perfect being, one that walked in righteousness from day one, you see that, to offer up a sacrifice for us. And it's him and him alone that God accepts. You see that? My prayer is that you'll get it. Amen. So we want to say thank you all for joining us today. We pray that something was said that had been a blessing to you. And we pray that you will continue to listen in to this broadcast. Have a blessed day.